Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel. It's been one of those evenings, you know what I mean by that, when God just builds a lot of character in us and it is this evening we couldn't get the live stream working, a sound card went out, but we're able to record this at this point. And we pray that you'll be looking at it and I pray that God will just bless you, that something through the word, he'll encourage you, he'll challenge you, he'll stir you. Well, let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you that you are sovereign and you're on the throne. And God, we look to you to lead us, to speak to us. We ask, Lord, that you'd open up the eyes of our heart, that you'd open up our ears and grant us the grace to walk in obedience to you. So we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I've titled this um, a couple different ways, Ready, Start, Go, Ready, Set, Go. Um, but what we're really focusing on is really the beginning of the, the Messiah's ministry. See, Jesus had spent most of his life, his ministry in the, the region of Galilee. And it's a mountainous area um, in northern Palestine. About three and a half years he'll spend there, maybe three years of a little time going back to, uh, again, to Jerusalem. But he grew up in a small town. It's interesting. It's called Nazareth. And Nazareth is also in Galilee. It's, it's more inland empire in that sense. But about three and a half miles away from um, this place, again, Nazareth, where Jesus was raised. It's obscure. It's little. And, and you know, it even say, does anything good come from Nazareth? And uh, it did because Jesus Christ came. But Again, as I started to mention, three and a half miles away is a, a town called Sephora. Sephora is a, a fascinating town. If you like likes and action of that day, that would be the town. In fact, it was very Hellenistic, the town. It was had a large Jewish presence that has been established through archaeology that lived in this town. And, and this Hellenistic uh, influence is quite interesting because it, it really, and we'll talk about it more, is it, it brought in the Greek culture. The Jewish people had been affected uh, tremendously, their attitudes, their actions. And in Sephora, even one of the rabbis in one of his own houses, he had a beautiful mosaic on the floor. And in the middle of it, the, the main heart of this mosaic was this, uh, again, this uh, zodiac sign. You can see how mysticism had come into the, the church. And it wasn't what it began. It wasn't what God intended. In fact, in another synagogue, probably about 20 miles away, and it was years later, they wanted to do something, and, and they brought one of the, again, one of the artists that did this mosaics. It was very interesting what he said, and he said, well, I can do this zodiac, and, and they said, well, no, no, we're a Jewish synagogue. We don't get into that. He says, everyone's doing it, and that's exactly what they did. They went ahead and put it in there, and that's what we hear today is sometimes people are saying, everyone's doing it, so it must be right. But in the scriptures, not. And we're going to see that Jesus, again, is teaching. It's radical. Radical in the culture that is there. Well, again, Jesus, at this time, he's going to move, and we're going to see again to down by the sea, and I'll talk a little more about it. But uh, it was an area that was more affluent at that time. Well, let's begin at verse 12. It, it begins all with the imprisonment of, of John the Baptist. It says in verse 12, Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken in custody, he withdrew into Galilee. Now, make a note in your Bible, John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51, because this is a passage that doesn't line up with the rest of the Scripture, but it's a, it's a passage that speaks about, again, that Jesus already had disciples when he was in Jerusalem. In fact, Peter and Andrew would be there later, and, and you can read it in those chapters. But these were some of the first disciples. It was actually before his ministry started. But again, notice again in verse 12, there's some key words. When Jesus heard and that John was taken into custody, he withdrew to Galilee. And it's not speaking from Nazareth at this point, coming over uh, to Capernaum, we're going to see. But he was coming back from Judea. And the scripture doesn't make it clear, but when you read those passages, again, I mentioned in John 1, 35 through 51, then you'll see it. It fits in the pieces of the puzzle. So Matthew 
uh, says more about that later, but he doesn't mention it at this point. He just mentions again the, the fact that it had upon Christ. Now, stop and think. I, I think of Lazarus fast-forwarding a while, and when Lazarus was in the grave, in the tomb, and he heard again that Lazarus was dead, knowing that he was going to raise him up. He wept. He got tears in his eyes. Jesus had the same emotions, the same feelings that you and I do. And I believe his response when he again heard about John, he was heartbroken. And we talked about John being a cousin in, in the family. And certainly there's going to be feelings. But he knew that John was a righteous man, that John stood for the very truth of what the Scripture said. And, and we don't have many men today that will stand upon the truth. They'll bow down to this world. But John was a man that had affected Jesus because it was a man that he wanted to see every man like. Well, he left Judea, as I mentioned, for Galilee, probably going to Nazareth and then Nazareth on over to Capernaum. And he was putting himself really out of the uh, reach of Herod at that time, if you remember. It, it was a sensible and uh, uh, a logical solution. But I think it was much more than that. It was a, a time. It was the beginning of a time. It was the beginning of his ministry. If you remember in Galatians 4, 4, it, it says, In the fullness of time God sent forth his Son, Jesus worked on a timetable. He didn't have a watch or a clock, but he knew it was the right time. You know sometimes in your life there are certain events and you know it's a time that you've got to move on. You've got to press on. There's a time to, to be still and know that he's God. A time to pray and a time to fast. And Jesus was a man affected by time too and moved by time. See, Jesus begins his public ministry by moving again, as I mentioned, from Nazareth to Capernaum. And it's after the rest of, again, John the Baptist. Now, John was arrested because he dared to say to Herod Antiquity, or Antipas, excuse me, uh, the marriage to his brother's wife was immoral. He stood for what was right. He stood for the truth. When you desire to stand in the truth, walk in the truth, the scripture is very clear. All who desire to live godly will be persecuted. Not everyone will be a, a, arrested, but we've known many in church history have been arrested just for saying the right thing. Now, there's many in this country who are saying, you know, persecution is on its way toward the Christians. And there's not a question about that. That's true. That means even if I just read the Bible, if I'm here when this happens... I have a choice to submit to the government if they tell me I can't not read the Bible or read the Bible and go to prison. What would you do if you were in that position? John was a one who stood on the truth. He believed that all things work for the good for those who love the Lord and called according to his purpose. Now look again, there's three I'm going to say underlining reoccurring themes in this uh, book of Matthew. One, uh, we're going to see in verses 14 and 16, really the fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the Scripture. The second, we're going to see in verse 15, really the salvation of the Gentiles. That word Gentile, um, it speaks of really the nations. You're either Jew or Gentile at that time today. There's three types today. There's Jews and Gentiles and there's believers. See, we're set apart, believers in the Messiah. We worship the King of Kings. The third thing that we'll see in this book that, that follows through this whole book, it's important to understand, is the announcement of the kingdom of God. Why is that so important? If you were 2,000 years, you could go back in time and you would speak to a Jewish person. There would be a few things in the history that would stand out. And one of them was the, the Syrians that came down from the north and, and they conquered the 10 northern tribes and led them away with fish hooks through their lips and took them back to Syria. 
the area uh, become a lot of Gentiles. It would become mixed in that area. And it would, later on, they would conquer, finally, uh, the, the capital, the, the city of Samaria. It would be conquered. And again, all of them would be led away. And that was changing, again, everything that was Israel is about to have 10 tribes taken away. Well, then later on in 586, the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. This is devastating emotionally and spiritually and how God allowed them to tear down the Sol Solomon's temple that he built. A magnificent temple. If you could only see it and I could see it, it would just, it would be unbelievable. I can see, again, from archaeology, and as they begin putting pieces together from the Scripture and understanding what it looks like. And, and a Jewish person was looking for the kingdom to come. See, this is why so many of them didn't receive Jesus as the Messiah, because they were looking again for the Messiah to set up this, again, this millennial kingdom, and they didn't understand. And every time I say that, I wonder if they didn't understand, what is it in your life and my life? And when we're reading the Bible, we don't understand. You know, pride comes before a fall. Whether it's just in this life, living it, or in the Bible, we can be so positive, so arrogant, calling attention to ourselves. Pride comes before a fall. And this is exactly what happened to Israel. They're looking, they're watching, they're, they're moving in large crowds to follow John, they're, this proclaiming of the kingdom of God, and the same message that, that, again, that John gave, that Jesus is going to give this message. Well, again, if this ministry, the beginning of the ministry is going to happen, it required, again, a withdrawal. A withdrawal, again, as I mentioned, from Judea and, and Nazareth, this little town. Hardly anyone went through this town. It was small and, as I said, obscure. But they moved to a place that's called Capernaum. Let me show you in verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, that was after they came back from Judea, as I mentioned in John chapter 1, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, the region of Zebulun and Nathalai. And, and this is an incredible area. It's beautiful. I wish everyone that listens and everyone behind, every, every Christian could go and see this Sea of Galilee. It is incredibly beautiful. The people are beautiful. There's much that you and I can learn just sitting around and talking the culture in restaurants and in coffee shops and, and, and talking about their history. And what's amazing now, the Jewish person today, for the most part, doesn't know anything about their history, only the history of the, the nation of Israel, unless they're the Orthodox Jew. It's at this point that Jesus made this important, as I mentioned, strategic move by shifting his headquarters to Nazareth, to Capernaum. I, I make it sound like a business, but no, he comes to Capernaum. Oh, it, it, it is a, it's a large town in comparison to Nazareth. In fact, it was known for, again, its, its tax collection station, which meant there were probably at least a hundred, again, soldiers there. There's a garrison there, and it's by the sea. Jesus makes it, a, a, again, a hub of his ministry. And the people flow through here. And what's interesting about it is it's, it's on this route, this trade route. It's on the, the way of the sea that would come again from the Mediterranean Sea uh, to a place, again, Caesarea Martina. And, and they would come up, even go through Nazareth, right around the edge of Nazareth, and come up and then eventually come through Capernaum and on up to Syria. The flow of people was incredible. It was a, a business route that people went through. And almost everyone in this area spoke Greek or they spoke Aramaic. Well, it's interesting when you see that Jesus moved to this town, uh, it, it's actually fulfilling the scripture. See, it was prophesied many hundreds of years in advance. Again, notice it with me in verse 14. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan. And notice Galilee of the Gentiles. And the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death upon them, a light dawned. 
Now, again, as, as Jesus came to this town, he would come from Nazareth. He would come through a, a pass, which is called the Valley of Doves, covered with doves. It's incredible. But that isn't even the incredible part. It was, it was the easiest way to come to this area, again, of the Sea of Galilee. Otherwise, they'd have to go all the way around. But he would pass an area, Mount Arbel. And if you're interested in just history about Israel and different things are happening, look up Mount Arbel. It was a period of time there when, again, after Jesus' death, after the destruction of, of Jerusalem, that many Jews hid in the cliffs and the caves up there, and the Romans would climb up and pull them out of the cliffs and drop them hundreds and hundreds of feet. There's so many battles that have been fought in this area. But as you're coming through this area, it is the most beautiful view that you'll ever see as you see this valley of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. Incredible. The farmland. The people fishing, a side note about it's interesting, the Sea of Galilee, uh, Peter's fish fast forwarding for a while. Anyone know what Peter's fish was? It's tilapia, what we eat here in Hawaii. It, it was huge and beautiful fish, and, and they would roast it. And Jesus is here, not for the fish, but for the people. And he will say to Peter later on, come and I'll make you fishers of men. It's no accident in everything that he says. So the, the central emphasis here on this passage is really the fulfillment of the scripture. That's, in fact, what he's quoting there is from Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 2. And again, these are the two of the most northern tribes of, of Israel. And um, it, it is just an incredible area, but the rabbis in that area um, were very strict about, again, the mixed blood because, again, it was, it was a lot of, again, and Gentiles. Now, notice again that it, it, it talked about that fact that uh, it was Galilee of Gentiles. But when Hellenism began to get established in the north, Jewish people began to move in because they liked the Greek culture. They began to adopt it. And Israel began to follow a, a lot of mysticism. And you see the difference it's going to make and a change. And it's interesting that Jesus would come to this way. So this way, uh, way to the sea was this trade route I mentioned. And again, it was, a, 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 again, all because the Syrians had come down and conquered it and left it full of Gentiles and they had intermixed between the land, much like that was in Samaria and, and even despised in many ways. Well, the Hellenist uh, culture, what, is, what does that mean? Well, a lot of people go, I, I don't get it. Well, when Alexander the Great conquered the world and died at a very young age, Again, every place he went, he brought Greek culture, Hellenism, the Greek language, the New Testament that you would find again, or the Old Testament with Septuagint was written in the Greek. And, and again, the New Testament was written in the Greek. And they brought about this language, Koine Greek. And, and, and we say, oh, gosh, there were a lot of things that began to taint their religion. But one of the things that I want to say tonight, and that is that one of the best things that ever happened was that they spoke again the Greek, the Koine Greek. Why? Because within a hundred years after the Bible was put together, assembled together, agreed upon, it became a dead language. And that meant that the language never changed. We can go back and look at secular studies and, and understand what the words meant to them then and we can understand what the, the words of the Bible meant at that period of time and how they were used. And there's no confusion on it. And so as much as the negative would bring about, there would be the good with the Koine Greek. What's interesting is we see it, 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 it was this infusion of the, the Greek with this non-Greek culture. It changed their thought process, their customs, their lifestyle. Uh, radically, it changed. They became, I'm going to say, worldly. And it's interesting as you remember the story about the, the pigs that went off the cliff. Many scholars believe that that was Jewish people raising pigs at that time. Now, we know pigs are unclean. Pork is unclean. But you know that they raise pork in Israel today? And they're not supposed to have it on the land, so what do they do? They pour a concrete slab. 
and they raise them on the concrete, and that makes it okay to raise them in the country of Israel. See, we all find a way around the law, what the Bible says. God says we're to love and go and forgive people. We're to go in the Great Commission, and we find excuses. We're going to find that God is so in love with people. This becomes a part of his mission. This is the beginning of his mission where it's, it's all about bringing man back to himself, back into fellowship with God. No matter how sinful you've been or I've been, God has open arms like the, the story of the prodigal son, the father looking for his son to come home and receive him back, and, and the father wants to receive you back. If, if you have never received Jesus Christ, he's calling you tonight. He says, come, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That heavy laden is the, the burden of sin. How could God ever forgive me? God wants to forgive you. And when you look at the cross, you know how much he wants to forgive you. He gave his only begotten son. Now, it's interesting. This is the beginning of the Jesus earthly ministry. But I want to take you back to Matthew chapter 1 just for a moment. And speaking about Jesus. And it says there in chapter 1, verse 21 and 23. And she will bear a son, and, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is God's desire. He has come to seek and save the lost. Please understand that in the context we're reading tonight. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. You know, those are, those are wonderful words. Repeat that back to yourself. God with us. God is here tonight with me and those that are, are with me here, and God is with you. Open your heart up to him. He's calling you. Now look again with me in, in later on in Matthew, Matthew 11, verse 23 and 24, and you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained till this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will do be more for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than you. More tolerable is what he's saying. See, Jesus is now making this his home, Capernaum. He's going to do so many miracles, and, and the people are going to close their mind and close their hearts. And people have been doing that for 2,000 years. Tonight is the night of salvation. If, if God's knocking on your heart, you know, call out to him tonight because you don't know if you have another day, another moment. Now notice again in verse 16, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death upon them, the light dawned. And, and this is talking about the, the mission and the purpose and the life. See, Christ's mission was the people. He focused upon the people. He focused upon those that were in darkness. And what I'm talking about is this spiritual darkness because of the influence of Hellenism, the influence of sin. It's just that natural bent towards sin that every person in this life has. But Jesus would focus upon people, so he moves to Capernaum because he has more exposure to people, allows him to move around this Sea of Galilee. There's over 200 and some villages in this area. And he would go from village to village teaching. So what it's saying is here, his, his mission is that Jesus went again to, to the needy lands. And, and not necessarily poor, there were poor people there, but what it's saying is they were spiritually poor. And he would come and bring them the message. He would go to those places that were in spiritual darkness. And darkness means ungodliness and everything unmoral that you could even think of and things that you can't even imagine beyond what you and I could think of. This represents the, the, the Gentiles, the, the unawareness of God because it was an area mixed with Jews and Gentiles. 
Again, their unawareness that there's one God because they worship many gods. And many of the Jews begin to worship many of these gods and they mix their religion together. For the Jew, it was simply being under the old covenant, the shadow of the old covenant, the, the, the burden it was, the wages of sin is death, the, the guilt that was on him. And, and he was the one that wanted to take that guilt away. He's the one that would go to the cross for them. And give his own life. There's no greater love than one who would lay down his life for his friend, for his brother. Well, again, to sit in darkness speaks of just being overcome by spiritual ignorance. Blind to the truth. I think back of my own life. I, I got saved in life. And, and the wasted life. I was that person sitting in darkness. I couldn't realize the depth of depravity in my own heart. But Christ came into my heart and little by little he began to, to change my life. And those that have had their lives changing are changing and still changing all of us. You know what I mean. But for those that don't, he's wanting to come in. He's standing at the door and knocking at your heart. Now, this imagery of, of darkness and light, it's clear and it's conventional. In fact, let me read from Matthew 6, 23. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? It's, it's talking about the spiritual darkness. When there's sin in your eyes, this darkness, your whole body becomes consumed. We, one sin leads to another sin. We begin to justify each sin we do, and it becomes darker and darker and darker until we harden our hearts completely against God. I know that was in my life. I, I knew the Bible, what it was when I was young. I, I knew what pleased God, and yet I chose to walk that darkness. Sin leads to more sin. Sin blinds us. It, 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 it gouges out our spiritual eyes in a sense and, and leaves us grinding away in this life. Verse 17, notice what it says. And from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. And I just have to say, wow, this reminds me of the great commission. You and I are given this great commission. Jesus started, this is when the ministry started, going out, preaching the gospel, proclaiming the truth. And it, it involves, again, if you notice, repentance. For the kingdom of heaven is hand. And, and we talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. They're interchangeable. And they didn't talk about heaven much, but we see it here in this book of Matthew. It's important to understand. Now, there's something interesting in the beginning of verse um, 17. Notice what it, the phrase from that time on. It's used by Matthew to indicate th there's a sharp turn, a contrast the Lord's teaching ministry begins. And we're going to see this repeated phrase as we go through this book. It's what he's proclaiming now is the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Thinking about Assyria, again, destroying the ten northern kingdoms, Babylon coming down and destroying Judah and Benjamin, the bondage are going on. These were words they want to hear. But it was a greater depth of meaning. The spiritual kingdom is it, really God's kingdom. As it is in heaven on earth, that's what he was really preaching. Getting right and repenting of our sins. Turning back to God from the foolish ways of man. And the second time this comes about, we're going to see it in Matthew 16, verse 23. When Israel's rejection of the king and the kingdom. Christ begins again to declare openly the, the necessity for his death and his resurrection. And three times before he goes to the cross, he will explain it to his disciples and they still don't get it. And people say sometimes to pastors, I've heard them say it, and even I was before as a pastor, well, why do you repeat yourself so many times? Because we don't get it. It takes so many times of deprogramming us before we can be reprogrammed with the truth. We have bought the lie of this world, hook, line, and sinker. 
Unless our eyes are opened up, we're going down for the count. We're headed to hell, the scripture says. But Jesus offers us free life if we would repent and turn back to him. And that's his message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' message builds upon the message that John the Baptist said. And, and all this was pointing, again, John the Baptist's message to Jesus, the one who would come. But what does repent mean? It oftentimes is not taught in many churches. People have told me repent means a, a change of mind. For those who had rejected Jesus, it's a change of mind who Jesus is and what they think about him. There's going to be a time for the, the Jewish people that will recognize the handprints and the prints in his feet and his side. And, and they'll recognize and they'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There will be this desire, this changing of mind. Uh, see, this is, this is the evidence, again, of a person who is saved. It's not necessarily speaking in tongues. It's repentance, turning away from this world's sinful ways and turning to God and walking in his ways. It's, it's a new way of thinking. It's living in a different way, the choices that you and I make. And some of the common external signs are, are simply the first ones I mentioned is repentance, repenting of those sins that have separated you from God. It includes prayers and prayers of remorse. And that remorse, it leads to a godly sorrow of repentance and confession and renouncing that sinful life and, and walking in that straight and narrow path that leads to life. I like what Charles Colson said. When we truly comprehend our own nature, Repentance is no dry doctrine, no frightening message, no morbid form of self, again, affliction. It is, as the early church father said, a gift of God that grants, grants us and leads us to life. That's what repentance does. It leads us out of the world and into the presence of Jesus Christ. Well, the next thing we see in the change in this ministry, the beginning of the ministry, first, it's really this, this call to discipleship. It's really from verse 18 to 22 today, where we see Peter and James and John. And those three will be a, of the inner circle of the 12 disciples. Well, look with me in verse 18. We see the calling of Peter and Andrew. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee... He saw the two brothers, Simon, who called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net on the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. When I first read that the first time, I, 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 I kind of threw my hands up in the air, and I, I just said, God, I, I, I don't get it. How can someone just hear that gospel that first time and, through, and just turn around and leave everything in their life. Well, that's what salvation is. It's a total about face. But again, as I mentioned earlier, as I was reading in John chapter 1, if you look up those verses, you'll find, again, that they had already recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, and God, the Holy Spirit, was working in their heart and convicting them. And Jesus, in a sense, was calling them like an altar call. Come and I will make you fishers of men. They heard what he had said when they were in Jerusalem and they were pondering on it, I imagine, thinking on what he said, recognizing what he had done. And they instantly respond. It's interesting, if you respond quickly, it's so much easier than if you just, every time you kind of, walk away, well, not today, not today, I'm not ready, because every time a person, again, walks away, they're hardening a little bit of their heart. At this point, we see the men, they, they turn, and they instantly follow. Notice again that they were at the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is just a, a freshwater lake. It's also known, again, of Gennesaret, it's the Lake of Tiberias, um, you can see across it very easily. It, it's very small. An interesting bit in history, um, several hundreds of years later, they had uh, kind of like big ships on the Sea of Galilee, and they're fighting battles on this sea. 
and the Jewish people at that time had a hard time crossing the sea because they believe if anyone went down, they, they went to Hades. So oftentimes when you're reading the Bible, it says they cross, they would go from kind of edge to edge to edge to edge to edge eventually until they got across. See, the Jewish people, again, because of the, the Greek culture, become very mystical. Well, it's interesting, again, Jesus calls them. They respond instantly. And as I mentioned, John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, you can read it there. Now, when Jesus said, follow me, Jesus called them to abandon their ordinary occupations to accompany him full time. I remember a man, um, he was telling me before he came to the Lord, he was arguing with the Lord. He says, Lord, I know that if, if I receive you as my Lord and Savior, you're going to send me to Africa and I don't want to go. And he would argue for this long, long period of time with the Lord. And, and then finally he gave in to the Lord. God sent him to Africa and he loved Africa. And then when he had to come off the, again, the continent and leave because his wife, again, had got very, very sick, he was mad at God for taking him away. And that, that's, that's our nature. All of us are like that in some capacity. Jesus calls us to abandon uh, not necessarily all of our jobs, but he uses, interestingly, what's in our hands. He will make you a, a new employee, a, a better employee. When a person responds to the call of Jesus, their lives basically are changed forever. Their occupation may remain the same. The way that they look at life is simply different. The choices they make, they live differently. And we're going to talk a little more about that in a second. But let's move on to verse 21. We see the calling of James and John. Going on from there, he saw, again, two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother, in the boat of Zebedee with their fathers. They're mending their nets. And he called them. Now, James is one of four persons that you find in the, in the New Testament. James, the son of Zebedee, was an apostle that we'll find in Matthew 10, too. Um, he was also suggested the brother of the apostle John, and apart from whom he never mentioned it in that way. James and John, together with Peter, became, as I mentioned, that inner circle, brought in close. They would be the leaders, and again, in the ministry in so many ways. Now, Father, down the lake were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And they were prosperous uh, fishermen. A, a number of men were on payroll, we learned from Mark 1.20. Again, they seemed to have this influence or knowledge of Annas, the high priest. If you remember when Jesus was being judged by the high priest. And they were able to, to move in. And you'll find that again in that, that same passage in John. But what's interesting is they left everything. They left their father, the business of their father. And their father, there's no response by their father of anger, lashing out, come back here. His father appears to be, again, a very noble, noble man. Look again in verse 22. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. They immediately responded to that call. They had saw Jesus. They had followed Jesus when they were in, in Jerusalem. But now Jesus calls. Sometimes people will come to church. Or they'll hear you speak the word for a long time. But one time they're going to hear him call. And they're going to have to make a decision. But what they did is they gave up their all. They relinquished the, the commitment to their family business. All for the livelihood of joining and following this messianic mission, let's call it. Later, we'll meet a, a woman, the wife of Zebedee, named Salome. Several times she's recorded in the Bible. Uh, she once asked Jesus to give her two sons an honor place in the kingdom. So you see that she's following close. She was present at the, the crucifixion. She was one of the women again at the uh, again at the sepulcher when after Jesus was buried and raised from the grave she was there. Some think that Salome was uh, 
the Lord's mother. They were sisters. That would explain the, the closeness, even knowing. Maybe the father just saying, you know, understanding, probably hearing about, again, what had happened when Mary was impregnated by the father, the heavenly father, that is. Knowing those miraculous circumstances around Jesus' birth. Look with me in Matthew 19, verse 27 and 30. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything to follow you. What then will be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, that you have followed me, and the regeneration of the Son of Man will sit in the glorious throne. And you shall sit upon the twelve thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left their house and brothers and sisters and father and mother and children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who will be first will be last and the last first. Jesus calls us. He calls us to come just as we are. He, he calls us not always to, again, to think about this, to leave our jobs, but to be a new person. Notice the king's credentials, though, in verse 23. The, the king is going to need these credentials if he's going to be ministering to the people. It, it says there in verse 23, Jesus was going through all of Galilee. Galilee, as I mentioned, was a region of 200 plus towns, at least 300,000 people. Um, and it, Capernaum was one of the major cities in that area. So his credentials where he was going to where the, the people were. They were going to where there was spiritual darkness. His teaching, notice he was teaching in their synagogues. That, that tells us there's a Jewish group of people. There needs to be at least 10 male Jews in order to have a synagogue. But there are various synagogues. And what's amazing on this coast, but further south, is a place called Magdala. If you read about Mary Magdala in the Bible, it's where she came from. And it's there. There's a, a location there, a first century synagogue where Jesus would have taught time and time again. It is incredible because there, there's no question, did he exist? The evidence that is found, spoken, and they dig it up and they find it. Well, Jesus' ministry, please understand, was a teaching ministry, just as I'm doing tonight. I'm not preaching. There's a little proclaiming mixed with, again, the Bible. But it's teaching teaching you how to understand the Bible, to look at the Bible, for teaching you how to feed yourself. Again, his teaching was in synagogues, but he was also preaching. And notice what it says in proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Proclaiming. Again, preaching means heralding, heralding the truth, the message. Uh, what was the message? Well, if we make it simple, it was the truth. It's an unfamiliar message. It was the herald the message, and it was the message, really, of this gospel of the kingdom, the good news, the Messiah is there, the, the long-awaited one is here. The message is Jesus himself. Now, look with me again, his healing, healing every kind of disease, every kind of sickness among the people, healing them physically, emotionally, uh, spiritually, setting the captives free from demonic activity. Jesus has a concern, and that concern is for the whole person, body, soul, and spirit, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Now, let me read from John 20, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, there are many signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Now, understand when it started in verse 30, these are signs. They were messianic signs. These are things that were written hundreds of years before that Jesus would do it. The Messiah would do that. And you know the wonderful thing about it? He performed so many miracles. There's not enough books in the world to record what he did. Every place he went, he touched him spiritually and physically and emotionally. But it was selective. As the Father would show him, he would do as the Father told him. 
And that's the same for you and me as the Father shows you and me and then we are to do as we're told. He says, go, fulfill the Great Commission. He's with us even until the end of the age. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. His calling is his enabling. Well, the fact is, again, Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, very clear. For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of this humble state into the conformity of the body of glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. We are have a citizenship in heaven. This, this place is not our home. As beautiful it may be in some ways, this is nothing. He's taken his home where there's no sin and no pain and sorrow. In fact, Revelation 21, 4 says this, and he will wipe away every tear from her eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, crying, pain, for the first things have passed away. We'll look again. Verse 24, we see his fame. The news about him spread through Syria. And they brought him all who were ill and those who were suffering with various diseases and pains and demonics, epileptics, paralytics. And he healed them. One day, Jesus will heal every person that calls upon his name. We will have new bodies. Now, this place, Syria, Syria is a, a Gentile region. It's north of Galilee. It's between Damascus and, again, the Mediterranean Sea. And it's, it's mentioned, uh, again, and it's mentioned that there's no other gospel. Many scholars think of the, the capital uh, of Antioch as, as really the location of Matthew's church. In fact, it was there, again, that Paul was sent out of his ministry from Antioch. And Barnabas, and he returned there several times. Look again at verse 25. The large crowd followed him. And this is important to understand. And they followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea from beyond the Jordan. And this is a, a large area. Galilee, again, was of the, the Gentiles, if you remember. Decapolis were 10 Gentile cities, Greek cities at that point. Again, in Jerusalem and Judea, which would be far to the south, and then beyond the, the Jordan, which would go into the area of Jordan. These are large areas controlled by Romans at this point in time. Again, the large crowd followed Jesus, had responded uh, in some sense to the teaching, the healing ministry, but many of them had not really become his disciples. A disciple is one who puts himself under another. You, you want to know the rabbi, if it's a rabbi, Rabbi Jesus, let's call him, you want to know what Jesus knows. You want to have the relationship he has with the Father. But they hadn't come to that point of being a disciple. In every church, many people come to church, but how many of them are truly disciples? Putting themselves under Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. Now, he had this great fame because every place he goes, he's, he's bringing the kingdom of God with him. He, he's giving them a taste of what the kingdom is, is going to be like. He's giving them a, a, a taste of the character, the nature of God, that they could see the, the goodness of God. This is the fruit of the, the ministry of the Messiah. It's the beginning of this ministry. And in the presence of Jesus, all all disease, affliction and pain and demonic oppression, disability, they all disappear. Now Jesus was calling, again in the beginning of this ministry, disciples to himself. He's calling today. He's looking today, not for men that are gifted in this one area, have the knowledge in this area or that knowledge. He's looking for people that are available. Because he wants to fill you with his love, his mercy, and his grace. He wants to make you the man, the woman that he would have you be. Not what you think, not even what you want to be, at least at this point. He's just looking for people to say, use me. What's interesting, when Jesus called Peter and Andrew, 
and his brother, they were casting a net into the sea. You, you live in Hawaii, you've seen people using a net and casting them in the sea. And he says, I'll make you fishers of men. That's very significant. Think about that. And then he, he sees the other two brothers. And again, that was James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and they're mending their nets. The thing I want to call your attention to about these last two things as we finish here is, is Jesus, when he calls you, I want to ask you, what is in your hands? If you're a gardener, he will use that gardening. He will use the things that you've learned as a gardener. If you're a businessman, he will use that. Here, casting nets, he's going to teach people to be evangelists. And not everyone has that gift of evangelism, but he'll, he'll teach it. And I love the one that's mending the nets. The idea of mending is like setting a, a broken bone. Ministry is a lot about mending broken people up. First the call goes out to salvation and then mend the lives and put the lives together. of Those that will submit to God, those who will trust in God. It's interesting, I find this true. I've talked to many people, and, and whatever was in their hand, whenever they're called, whatever they're doing, God uses that. Maybe they were a ministrator, and they become a ministrator of a church. When God called me, I was a, a nurseryman. I, I grew plants. I sold plants. But really what I thought the most is I, I nurtured plants. I healed plants. I fed plants. And just as I did it in a nurseryman with plants, God has, has brought me to a place of being a, a pastor who feeds sheep, who ministers to sheep. The very thing that I was doing, I had no idea what I would do. God takes that. So whatever you're doing, when God calls you, there's something. He's trained you. He's prepared you. He's, he's made you that way. And now he wants to use that gifting, that ability that he's given you, but not in the way that you might think. And the way he thinks, he begins chipping away at our hearts. He had to remove the pride in my heart. And still, I know he's chipping away in those areas. Just as all of us, he has those struggles. So just as he's done in my life, he wants that to do that in your life. And there's no greater joy than being used by God knowing that he's equipped you, he's given you the ability, he's given you the mind, the reason. You're being conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus so you can bring the fragrance of Jesus to those that need to hear. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your patience with us when we're impatient. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you have called us and you've set us apart as vessels of honor. You cleanse us and you fill us. You pour us out and you fill us up again. Thank you that we can be used by you. No matter what background, no matter what work we've done, we come to you just as we are, thinking that there's nothing that we can give you. And all we need to do is give ourselves completely to you. So, Lord, that's our desire tonight, to give ourselves afresh and new to you. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. God willing, we'll see you on Sunday morning. Bless you.